<clears throat> Welcome uh, to the Women's Global Health Institute um, interview series. Tonight's discussion will be hosted by Dr. Leah Jamison and will feature Dr. Moira Gunn. She's an engineer and award-winning radio journalist who will talk about how biotechnology relates to women's health, her personal career path from engineer to media host, and her experiences in balancing work and life. I'm Dorothy Teagarden, the director of the Women's Global Health Institute. And hello, I'm Ulrike Dudag, Associate Director of the Women's Global Health Institute, which serves as a nexus of interdisciplinary research to create partnerships, promote research and develop training opportunities to improve the health of women globally with a focus on research on prevention and early detection. Our interview series highlights distinguished scientists and leaders on research, leadership, career paths and work-life balance. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the interview with Dr. Gunn. We're excited to have such a high numbers of registrants. We are also excited to welcome and thank the co-sponsors for this event. We, have, we want to thank the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease, the College of Health and Human Sciences, the College of Engineering, Women in Engineering, College of Liberal Arts, Butler Center for Leadership Excellence, and the Purdue Graduate School. If you have questions at the end for Dr. Gunn, please enter them into the Q&A box at any time, and we will try to cover as many as possible at the end of the interview. I'm now turning back to Dr. T to introduce the interviewer for tonight's discussion. So I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Leah Jamison, the Randsburg Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and the John A. Edwardson Dean of Engineering serving from 2006 to 2017, Emerita, sorry. And her awards and accomplishments are really extensive, of course, so including achievements in both education, research, and service. So I'm only gonna name a few of these. So she served as president and CEO of the IEEE in 2007 and president of the IEEE Foundation from 2012 to 2016. She's recognized for excellence in many ways, including being elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was also an inaugural recipient of the NSF Director's Award for Distinguished Teaching Scholars. She is the perfect host for tonight's interview, as she has a long um, she has long been an advocate and activist for to promote the success of women in engineering and computer science including co-chairing the Computer Research Association Committee on the Status of Women in Computing Research, and she's and serving on the steering committee for the National Academy Report on the impact of COVID-19 on the careers of women in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine. And I personally have seen her in action in her advocacy for young women scientists here at Purdue. So thank you very much, Dr. Jamison, for agreeing to serve as the interviewer for tonight's event and for introducing Dr. Gunn. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I, the invitation just was excited me so much. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with Dr. Moira Gunn, whom I will also call friend Moira Gunn. Um, so I, and I, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Moira. Um, Dr. Gunn is founder and host of the long running radio programs, Tech Nation and Biotech Nation. Um, since their start, she has interviewed over 3000 people, among them CEOs, scientists and engineers, venture capitalists and politicians. And her interviews are, here's the plug, widely available via radio and podcasts. Um, her early career included work as a scientist and engineer at NASA, IBM, Lockheed Martin, Rolls-Royce, the US Navy, and others. Um, her stature as a radio journalist who probes the intersection of science, technology, and society has been widely recognized. Um, her book, I have a copy of her book over here somewhere. Um, I, welcome to Biotech Nation, my unexpected odyssey into the land of small molecules, lean genes, and big ideas, was named the best science books list by the li library journal. And the National Science Board awarded her the Public Service Award for her contributions to the public understanding of science and engineering. Um, Dr. Gunn earned her bachelor's degrees in computer science from the University of San Francisco, where she has returned 
to add associate professor and director of entrepreneurship to her ongoing radio journalism roles. And, and now the important part, after her bachelor's degree, um, she went on to earn her next two degrees from Purdue, a master's degree in computer science, and her PhD in mechanical engineering, becoming the first woman to earn a PhD in mechanical engineering from Purdue. She's been recognized for her career achievements by Purdue with an honorary doctorate in science, which is the highest award that the university bestows. And she's here with us today, um, as Dorothy said, to talk about her experiences, her career, her career changes, women's health, work-life balance, and more. So it is genuinely a pleasure to welcome my friend, Dr. Moira Gunn. Moira. Well, thank you so much. And what a wonderful introduction. After your introduction, I should be interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say that um, interviewing somebody who has interviewed 3,000 people um, strikes me as one of those things that gives pause. It's like, excuse me. Got a question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Like Elizabeth Warren, got a plan. I got a question. <laughs> okay. Well, and I'm going to just say, let's start near the very beginning. Um, your bachelor's and master's degrees are in computer science. Your master's from Purdue. First woman to receive a PhD in mechanical engineering at Purdue. So in a lot of uncharted territory, I would say. Um, what challenges did women students in these fields face at that time? And what challenges did you face in your early career? Well, uh, let's just take the going to school first. Um, and, and essential to what you're saying is uh, challenges when you start to be the first at doing things. Um, the, uh, that's a different mode of operation in itself. And I started actually as a math major. Math majors have to take physics. They have to take ordinary and partial differential equations. They have to take all these things, which all the engineers do. So I didn't come out of a purely computer science mode. I didn't come out of a pure math mode. I came out of a mode that which math was and physics were very important, where building things were important. So while it may seem like a big leap over to mechanical engineering, it, it wasn't, and that I had, you know, unbeknownst to me, but my major professor went over and checked. It's like, whoa, you have all these? Come on over, come on over, we can transition. Because at the time, so many years ago, which we won't say what the years, but um, at that time, computer science was very new. Very few people started in computer science. The computer science department at Purdue was the first to offer a master's degree ever anywhere in the United States. Um, and so we're talking about builders. So building was natural to me. The second part of that early part is, is doing things that no one has done before. This is essential to being an engineer and, uh, and essential to making breakthroughs in life. It means you have to kind of be willing to, whether you're a woman or anything else, you've got to be willing to have people say, it's not done that way. The moment you say that, you hear that, you know, other people have been doing things and they want you to do them like them. No, that's not how innovation works. So early on, I was kind of doing fits and starts. It's like, well, I could go here and do that. But when I heard new things, I was very attracted to them. I like to build and I like new things. So early on, it was, that was interesting. And then we get, you know, into, you know, into when I finally got into mechanical engineering and there were nothing but male professors, not a female on site. There were nothing but male graduate students, not a female in sight. I remember I was working in the lab about a month after I got there. And one of the engineers, one of the students turned to me and said, we knew you were going to come here. We didn't know you were going to do anything. <laughs> it was like, oh, <laughs> news to me. Oh. <laughs> so understand that other people's expectations of you are independent of your expectations of yourself, not just by means of ambition, but, but what you know, what you can go. Then you get into your career. My first career, early career was at NASA. And um, I remember being at NASA. And of course, there were nothing but guys there. And uh, uh, someone said to me, what's that like being in a meeting with a woman in it? 
And I said, I've never been in a meeting without a woman in it. You got to ask them. You know, because I don't know. It was new. So whoever you are, wherever you're from, you're going to meet these things where you just don't look like or to, and you, know, you finally go, you know, I used to finally say to people, what's the matter? You never saw an engineer before, you know, it's like, this is what they look like. So the expectations of other people are always what's stopping, you know, and then you've got to, I wouldn't say fight them or go over and go around them. <laughs> just, go, just go around them. Let them think they have the last word. And then just, zip around and i'm sure you have a similar sorry interviewer me i sure i'm sure you have similar experience leah in many ways yes um although i actually gave a talk about a year ago to um a women in signal processing group which was, i was one of the co-founders many many years ago um and I, one of the slides was you know number two and it wasn't about avis um, is that I actually found myself in, in not all, but in a lot of places, being the second woman to have been there. And looking back, realizing um, that at least the ground had been broken. The problem is that people then expected me to behave exactly as that woman had, because that was their only no definition. Woman. No <laughs> women. No, and I mean, this was true when I... When I came to Purdue, I was the second woman faculty member in electrical and computer engineering. Violet Haas was the first. Um, the fact that you didn't have any in ME, um, yeah, I could have told you that because when I joined, there were I became the third woman in the entire College of Engineering on the faculty, and so there were you know two in double E, you know, one in. I need to remember where it was, but I, I, it was one of Lillian, materials. I want to say Lillian, that was Lillian one. Gelbreth pioneered all this in the 30s for all of us, but then there was a big gap. Um, okay. But it was true also, I was the second woman president of IEEE. Um, and just thing after thing, it's like not the first, but I so I've got second a little is bit as of a hard as there. the first. Second is as hard as well. The, first. the expectations are different. No, I mean they do. They expect you to be like the first one was, and that's not true either. And sometimes <laughs> I think it felt harder to overcome that. Um, I, the other, I think, the first time I realized that, even in this case, I was one of 50 and the 50 were out of a thousand was when I um, went away to college and went to MIT. And they handed each of us a map with the women's rooms on it because they were so few and so hard to find. And then it's like, oh, this is going to be different, isn't it? But Although let's talk good. about women's rooms, why not? In those days, a woman's room had to have a separate little room that you could lie down on because you were so delicate. The frail, yeah, I know. Those are gone. And some the of those counters got there. They're out of there. <laughs> and there are a few places at Purdue that still have those. So I, I'm no, not that's a map I want to wear. Yeah, that's a map <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> so, okay. So, you, so what about early career? Well, I started at NASA. You know, and so, I mean, that was great because at NASA, you never did anything that anybody had done before. You wouldn't do it at NASA. You know, that's really kind of sounds funny, but it's simple. But there's a lot of people who don't who don't embrace innovation. They they look around saying best practices. The moment anybody says, what are best practices? They ain't talking about NASA. They're talking about you. If you want to make that leap, you know, that's it. And and the big thing is I came back to California. I was in the middle of Silicon Valley. That's where NASA Ames was. And I left there and went to at the Institute for Advanced Computation, which was, you know, we were doing very large computing processes and all kinds of global things. And then from there I went and I was working on a number of things for a number of organizations, uh, as you were listing earlier. Um, and uh, I think that the big thing was, there was two things. One is that industry and government and everybody, every organization needs people that can organize a project and get things done. 
And if they say it's going to be done in two weeks or two months, it's either done or they raise their hand and said, nope, can't get it done. Here's the reason. Women are had, were much more communicative. And so while I had a few women around, not at the PhD level, um, I had a hard time getting information. But management really looked to me to say, well, doesn't matter what you guys are doing. She's actually talking to us. And we're getting information. So I uh, learned very early on that I was able to manage projects because you don't really get a degree in project management. I was able to manage projects and communicate. That was really key. And so that is what actually moved me ahead. There were times, I mean, I was thinking about this today because I knew I was speaking with you, Leah, where uh, I was at a NASA Institute, working at a NASA Institute. There were five uh, divisions at the Institute. Four of them had division chiefs. Mine had a, an, a blank space for division chief. I was deputy division chief running the division. <laughs> they weren't looking for a division chief. You know, so these were days before you, you couldn't, have, today you couldn't imagine that, would not be acceptable. So these were days in which the kinds of things we're thinking of today, you know, would be recognized immediately, were not. So we were just doing our part at that time, just as the people who were listening to us or watching us today are going to do their part in their time. And uh, they may or may not be women. They could be from anywhere in the world. They could be doing anything, uh, but they're not the likely suspect to do it. So I got just used to working in, yeah, whatever, whatever. I'm just going to keep going ahead. But because I was making things happen, I always had opportunity. You know. And at some point, you did a change of direction. Um, <laughs> leaped from whichever of the jobs it was at that time to starting Tech Nation and becoming a journalist and a radio journalist and a science journalist. Um, so what did that path look like? Um, what, what triggered it? Um, what skill sets did you need to make the transition? Besides your superb education in engineering My and science. Education. Come on, yeah. It's a little like going to the airport and knowing you're leaving for 10 years and not knowing where you're going. I just wanted to put that. It's like, what am I going to take with me? You take your education with you. He's like, well, what am I going to do? Um, I think that uh, uh, I had a very strange opportunity that came this way. I had a call from what is now Ogilvy and Mather, which is a huge international uh, communications firm. And they had a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a campaign, they would call it, where between Atari computers, which dates it, how far back is that? And General Foods Post cereals, you've all eaten them, you know what they are. And, uh, and they were going to cut out proof of purchase seals from post cereals and uh, exchange them for educational software from Atari computers. And they were going to go into like 10 major cities in the US and have computer learning festivals so people could learn about catch on to computers, they called it, because nobody had a computer then. It was just sort of new, all this stuff. And they had a couple of people who were the spokespeople and nobody could actually, they weren't sure what they were. I don't know what they were doing, but they had one open slot and they said, could you come in and fill in Chicago? I said, sure. You know, so I fly to Chicago, no matter what they ask you, the answer is buy cereal, turn them in. You know, that doesn't matter what the question is. I can teach anybody that. And then I flew back. And when I flew back, they fired both other people and said, can you do the rest of this? And so I learned what it was like to be out on the road and to learn. There's little bitty radio stations and big ones. There's Eyewitness News at noon. There are, um, you know, mainstream ones. Then there are these places, little dinky places. Media was everywhere with all different things. 
and people had different needs and they were all over the country. And it was my insight into that. And it turned out <laughs> I could, for a while there, if you looked at me, I'd say buy cereal, but it was, <laughs> it was, it was my real thing was how do you get kids interested in these science experiments because Atari had actually worked it out so you could put this into your little Atari computer and do various science experiments. I thought that was great. Do it yourself. That was fantastic. And uh, so Girl Scout troops, schools, churches, anybody, nonprofit could you know, get this going. And so that's when I realized that. And I ran into, I had taught as an adjunct at the University of San Francisco, very close to my house here, where I'm now a professor. And ran into, they invited me to the Christmas party because they invite everybody to the Christmas party. Ran into the person who was in charge of the radio station. And I told him about this great experience I had. And he goes, well, you could do a radio show here about, you know, and I'm looking at him and he, I said, well, if I was going to do anything, I do it on technology. And he said, oh, you mean like personal computers? You mean like this or that, or, you know, like all this tech stuff. And I'm like, nobody wants to listen to that. <laughs> I'm so crazy. He goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, if God didn't make it, it's technology. And he went, oh, and that was the beginning of Tech Nation. And so started there, more and more people were listening. One day, about a year later, I get a phone call because in those days we did phone calls and voicemail to, you know, book people. First day when I interview, what I consider interviewing Eddie Fisher. Now, a lot of people listening wouldn't know Eddie Fisher, Elizabeth Taylor. Well, he recorded in the 1940s. Then, you know, the next day the phone rings, would I interview Noel and Ryan? Now, a lot of people here is like, well, kind of like baseball player you know, but he was like, get your technology, get all that medical technology, get ahead of this. Third day, I looked at the phone. What is, you know, then nothing happened. Thursday, the phone rang. Very nice PR person, public relations person said, would you consider interviewing Linus Pauling? And I went, <laughs> I think we have something here. <laughs> I think we have something here. The only person to single-handedly have a Nobel Prize. And I said, you know, he's a chemist. It's like he almost got the structure of DNA. Uh, and so we went down and interviewed him. And then I said, okay, we're moving up. We have something here. We have relationships. We're understanding what's going on. And from there, we just started the show and never looked back. You know, so uh, in fact, in the early days, the WBAA, they didn't have a downlink, a satellite downlink. So for them, I would make a tape put it in FedEx, it would go, FedEx goes to Atlanta and up to there. So, and then one time there was a snowstorm in, in Atlanta and they didn't get the show. <laughs> they were like, oh. we don't know what to do, we don't know. But uh, since then, it's just been like clockwork. Although I understand WBAA is taken over now by uh, Indianapolis. Yes, by Indianapolis, yep. But we'll have to call them, make sure we're still on. Yeah, Everybody I think that I, would, I would suggest that. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> they won't know who we are. <laughs> I doubt that that will be the case. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you see, you know, the start at WBAA is a pretty good thing to be able to point to. Absolutely. You know, but it was like the B WBAA listeners, they knew exactly what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. everyone is, you know, the, the, the university is just a hotbed of science, technology, engineering, uh, and even the business school, because you've got to get it out of there. You've got to get it into yeah. the hands of people. And so when you look at that, they're like, Oh, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. And so it's been a great audience and we continue to love it. You know. So have you ever run into, um, I would hope not so much now, but maybe still now, but, but then um, people being surprised that somebody who was able to talk to them about so many forms of technology who also happened to be a woman. Well, you know, I'm kind of on the other side of that. And I'll tell you, uh, I don't know, there is a 
I don't know if I should tell you people listening this, but we'll just, we won't tell anybody. Um, the uh, I had a number of the senior professors over to my house for just a couple of glasses of wine. And we were talking about sexual harassment because we all had some unbelievable stories. I had one from when I interviewed at NASA. It's like unbelievable stories. And all of a sudden somebody said, hey, Nobody's harassed us in like 10 years. What's wrong with us? You know, <laughs> and what this person was talking to is that about is that you are most vulnerable to this earlier in your career. You are young, you're getting taken advantage of by someone who is older. And that's when you're really, really taken advantage of. So as you get later, you kind of, that's not happening. The reaction is not happening so much, but the, uh, uh, and so they're still kind of surprised you're there. How did you make it here? Nobody else made it. But that that tool is sort of out of their toolbox. Still, I would say about 10 years ago, I think the, the one that sticks in my mind is I was in, I was in Sweden actually interviewing some people on a larger trip. And uh, I was interviewing this gentleman. And as I was asking every question, he kept going, <laughs> talk a little bit, like, yes. and it was like, about the sixth time I said, if you keep coughing while I'm talking, we're never gonna get an interview. And then I realized his trick was, if you have the floor, he'll just cough. So, be aware of the tricks people use to steal the energy from you or steal the floor from you or steal how serious you are. Be aware of that. And I got a, uh, I got a tremendous uh, piece of advice from a gal who had experienced a whole lot of that stuff. And she said, uh, she was rather short. She was on the, like 4'10", 4'11". And she goes, I couldn't sit up in the chair high enough to, you know. And what she would do is she would get up, go over to where they had coffee. Because in those days, you always had coffee in the corner. I don't think anymore. I think you bring in big paper cups. But you'll find a reason to stand up, exit the room, come back in. And she said, and while I was standing, I would say, well, you know, that's very interesting. So while they're sitting around, I'm standing and I actually have the floor, all very casual. So when you're younger, you will be, you will be the target and it can be very, it can be very debilitating. And the good news is, is when you get older, less and less, but be on the lookout, be on the lookout. There's always, there's always something out there. Change of direction. Um... From the over 3,000 interviews you've done with scientists, venture capitalists, politicians, and others, um, you have heard, I'm sure, many women's health issues. Um, noting that the interview is a part of the, the Global Women's Health Institute series, um, from all that you've learned from those interviews, what, what do you see as the most important and urgent issues in women's global health? Well, first let's focus on global. We have a tendency to look at the US. When we look beyond there, we look to the EU and UK and possibly Japan, and then we kind of drift away. Let's talk global. Um, if we listen to the Drugs for Neglected Diseases initiative from Geneva and Dr. Bernard Percule is its executive director, he was also had a very high position with the um, Doctors Without Borders and, and took this from there to create its own initiative. Um, we have to remember that the pharmaceutical industry is an industry. It's a company, it's a business. If uh, you uh, look at your local grocery store, it's like, yeah, they got to get the product in and I have to have the money to pay for the product so I can take the product home. Nobody says the, the 
the local grocery store has to have or a supermarket has to have all this product. I don't have any money for it. So I'm just going to take it home. It has to work. That's how the global pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry works, um, and it, which is part of it, part and parcel. Um, but when they studied it, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, they identified that the diseases which we see these global pharmaceutical companies treating are for about 12% of humanity, 12 one, two, 12% of humanity. And those are the people who can pay. And if you look at the revenues, how much is going into the United States who can afford to pay a lot versus other places. And then you look down, it's like, that's what they can afford to pay. Well, the pharma industry, you know, it would, it, first of all, it would be misguided, frankly, to think we just have to, we just have to raise more money so we can pay for drugs to send to the rest of humanity. This is not their diseases. You know, we don't have a big need to treat dengue fever. When we're talking about Zika, it only touched us, our shores a bit. It touched other places with the exception of Puerto Rico very seriously. And if you remember the consequences for uh, pregnancies, very big. If that had hit the middle of the U.S., we would see so much effort going into treatment, diagnosis, you know, vaccines, but we are not. And uh, I just want to say that if we look at, we can look at the World Health Organization, we can look at their list of women's issues, we can create our own list. You know, if we're looking at all women, and there is the health impact of poverty alone. There are sexually, involuntary sexually transmitted diseases. There is childbirth. There is aging. There are so many things, not to mention COVID in close quarters with your families. So I think we want to keep that 12% in mind. Why? Because this is economics. There's no natural law of physics here that we're fighting against, or, you know, it's, it's just like gravity. It's economics. Economics are made by humans. You can change economics, just as Mohammed Yunus took the um, uh, founded Grameen Bank, and in, in clusters of five women, head of families each, funded micro lending so that they could bring them all out of poverty, take care of their kids, make sure they're educated, bring them medication, all of this. That was, Mohammed Yunus was not a humanitarian per se or philanthropist. He was an economist. He said, we can see this in a different way. So what I challenge everybody here listening is yes, Let's go out there and work on these problems. Let's go at this. But let's think about economics. How can we have a global set of economics that changes? There could be multiple programs that changes how things are so that we can support women and the situations in which they're in, understanding that it's a, it's a far more, it's more complex, but it's not that much more complex. It just requires sensitivity. Um, and just like those impoverished fam families in Bangladesh, uh, new economics can always be created. And to me, along with all the technology and science and engineering we need to do, we need to think of new ways for economics to work. And that will make a big difference. Okay. What, um... You know, you said, you know, focusing on global and, and that, that, that is a incredibly critical point to think about with this. Um, how, um, how frequently has that been um, the focus when you are interviewing people about health, about well-being? Um, how rare is that perspective? Well, guilty, guilty. <laughs> I'm like, what are you working on? <laughs> and how far are you along? And who's trying what? And who's doing this? It's like that, that's where 
or really focused, but but also focused on understanding how these trials work. Um, and if you were a person in the trial, what would it be like? Uh, and the the FDA is the most stringent in the world. So we know that they've made every effort to make sure it's safe and it works. It's that simple. It's safe and it works. Now, there's a lot going on in the world. I'm going to give you an example of stem cell treatments, of which we have about 11 approved in the United States. We're all looking forward to more stem cell treatments. This is great. Well, uh, the uh, one of the Nobel Prizes went to a Japanese scientist in stem cell research. Um, and Japan got very excited about this, saying we should do more. And so instead of going through the, I'm going to, you know, first, you know, do a bunch of tests on animals or not animals, we can talk about that as well. But before we get to humans, and then is it safe, and then see if it's efficacious. Um, they said, if we, if you can prove a stem cell treatment is safe, that just does not do any harm, we're going to let you sell it to anyone, and you have eight years to prove it's effective. And uh, they have about the same approval number as we do, but they have 3,700 plus stem cell treatments that you can just walk off the street into a storefront and order. Say, I would like this one. Now, some people think, well, that we're doing the research. In science, you have to narrow down who you're looking at to remove all the parameters and measure a number of things to see if it's effective or not. You can't just give it to people and have them say, I'm just going to fill out a form like when you order something on Amazon and said, how did we do? It's like, I would give a million dollars if I had it to give. Amazon quit sending me, how did you do? You know, <laughs> it's not, this is not science. This is not science. So but it's like, wow, in Japan, 3,700 plus treatments. We're seeing that kind of adoption in of, of, of regulation in India, 1.6 billion now. In China, well over 1 billion. We're talking about a wave of changes in, in approvals of drugs and how we do it that uh, is going to happen in the next 20 years. How it's going to happen, what it's going to affect, I don't know. But I think we have to take a look at that and understand that what, how we've been thinking about it and doing it in the past may well change. And it may well be driven by the needs of those people outside of the EU and the UK the U.S. and Japan, the largest markets for such things, because they need these things. Much different than right to try. You've heard of right to try. That is after you've exhausted everything that's been approved, you can then exercise a right to try. This is, you can start this in the beginning. And if you could speak to Steve Jobs, he spent a little over a year trying a number of treatments he thought had promised, but were not approved, and then went back to the standard. And he said, I should have started there because I, I would have known. So there's it. this is life. It is not easy. And we've got to decide how to deal with it, what's the right thing. And, and you know, there, there are many issues there that I could talk about. Uh, the word life is a, is, is a good um, pivot because my next question for you is, um, what does a typical day look like? And <laughs> how do you work... How do you approach career life balance? Well, I'll take typical. Notice that I didn't say achieve. I just said approach. <laughs> yeah, I think about that for about 12 seconds before I get out of bed. I do a set of things in bed before I get out of bed. The, uh, now, remember that my children have grown. So I don't have to like bounce out of bed and get those kids, you know, right away. And my grandchildren are only with me occasionally, but um, at, which brings me right back. But normally um, uh, I get out of bed, set the alarm for 7.30, 7.35. I get up before eight. And but right from the moment I start to wake up, I start to think about my day. You know, what do I have? 
I might have even checked that the night before. So I have a sense of the day. I start setting alarms. You know, the pre, the po, you know, it's like, it's like, I got to say the iPhone is going to seem to have a, you can set an alarm for every minute of the day. It's like, fine, let's do it. We'll do it. Yeah. Uh, so those, so there's the one that's like, hey, wake up. You got to be doing such and such. So I know those are in place. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I really like my life is that I never know quite what I'm going to be doing. Sometimes I teach. Sometimes I'm interviewing people. Sometimes I have to prep things for an interview. Um, sometimes I'm going to go have fun with my friends. I just, there's a million things that I can do, but I have a lot going on. But um, but work-life balance, I think that is, that is, we've talked about that forever. You know, part of this is that, uh, especially for women, because you ask men and they go, what's the problem? Having a baby? That's not big. It's like, you're not having the baby. I'm having the baby. You know? Yeah, that one we haven't worked out. Still takes nine months. Nobody's worked out how to have it shorter. You know, that's it. That's what it takes. And then you've got to raise this baby. You've got to raise this child and you have to be involved with it. And that has to take priority. There's no way around it. But there will be times within that in which your work can take priority, in which you can start to do balances. And that's um, that I'd like to say a couple of things about. You always will know when your work and life is out of balance. You just know it. You're like, this is just too much. Or I need to be doing, the, you know, something's out of balance. You know, it's like, I've been having too good a time. That doesn't happen too often. I've been working too much. That happens. Um, but uh, but both could happen. You know, it's like, where's the balance? And uh, the first thing I would like to say is you are only, you're the only arbiter of your work-life balance. When it's out of balance, you're probably going to get a lot of advice from people. And they don't even think it's advice. They're telling you. Now, you should be doing this and not doing this. You give up that. It's not, I had somebody tell me something today. I was like, oh, really? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Are you I was like, thank you for your input. Always say, thank you. Thank you. Always say that, but never say you're going to do it. Um, but there's, especially early in your career, it's important to learn something that actually was advice given from a dean of business at the University of Colorado that my youngest son went to. I took him to you know, to get him all settled there. And he had all the, the freshman uh, business majors there. And he said, look, I got to tell you something. You have about two and a half hours a day where if you are left alone, you can deeply concentrate and do something. And I was like, turns out it's about right. Might be a little more, might be a little less, but there's only, you only have about that much juice in you. So he said, don't waste it walking the dog. Don't waste it talking to your friends. And they said, the other part is, is for each of you, it's at different times in the day. Some of you may do that at midnight. Others of you may get up at five in the morning. Others may find it's two in the afternoon. Find the place that you are able to, in your physiology, concentrate. And that's what you must defend. So for work-life balance, some people may say, well, just don't do that. Go over and do that. That's exactly in the middle of when you can concentrate. So you have to find that for you. So that's the first thing, because unless you do that, you can't really move anything forward. You know, that's really what you've got to figure out how to defend. Um, and then the other part is what you adjust in your schedule. Everybody has a lot of opinions about this as well. It doesn't really matter. Um, but one thing that I've noticed that people have not figured out is what they like about themselves, their schedule and what they don't. They're just like, well, I, I'm trying to do this analytically. Let me move this around. The clue to me is when you enjoy something, time flies. When I'm interviewing somebody, there is no time. I'm like, Leah, who's probably excruciatingly, this is a really long interview for her. But for me, it's no time. It's time out of time. It could be an hour. I could do things for five hours. It's just like, I just love doing this. But you'll notice time flies. 
no matter whether you should be or it's good for you or somebody has to do it or whatever, it goes slow and maybe you make stupid mistakes or you put things off. This is your clue. If you, for those things that you love to do, because it just goes like that, those are not the ones you should mess around with. <laughs> it's the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I just did something the other day that I'm embarrassed to say took me 30 years. Now I have to put all these, all of these shows together. I mean, I don't put them all together, but I, I, I manage the edit. And sometimes we're short, for instance, uh, you know, a few minutes, but we're not going to put another interview in or what are we going to do? We're going to find another interview, stick it in here. What are we going to do? And we were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And so sometimes if it's about two, two and a half minutes, then they have me write more tracks, as we call them, that finish that up. And so for years, I'd be like, okay, oh, it's short. Okay, I do that. And then I read the whole thing over again and time it. <laughs> just about a month ago, I realized, and I just timed this, it was, if I take the number of words divided by 2.4, I know exactly how long it's going to take. 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. Yay, math. Be surprised. You know, now somebody else is saying, well, that's obvious. Wasn't obvious to me you know, and I was doing the job. So it's looking at your life, figuring it, maybe I get somebody else to do it. I could do it differently. Maybe this is the good one. This one, everyone, when you're mothers or fathers and time goes, maybe I could not do it at all. And no one would notice. You'd be surprised how many times that happens. <laughs> I've been just doing this for you. Nobody cares. You know, so it's the stuff that, that is, those are the ones I don't care. Other people, they don't get the joy out of it that you do. Just ignore that. Just say, well, thank you. But that's it. So those things, I think, are the things that help with work-life balance. And it's just going to change over time how you juggle them. But remember, divide by 2.4, you know how long it's going to take. <laughs> Spread that okay. out. <laughs> and no, that that's great. Um, I have one more question, and then we're going to turn it over to, to questions from the audience. Um, and it's it's wrapping back to... Um, communication and science communication and tech communication and engineering communication. Um, and, and I a good did to, you know, the context is that um, I think the pandemic and the plethora of misinformation and contradictory and misleading information that we experienced um, related to COVID-19 um, demonstrated how important your work is and how fragile the idea of trust and communication is. And so my question is, and, and I'm going to have to ask you to be brief because we do want to turn to the audience questions. Yes, we do want to hear but, them. We do. But um, do you have thoughts on how to effectively communicate with the public, to the public, with the public about advances and issues in science, especially biotech related science and engineering? How can um, we do better? We said two things are important. One is trust, is that the only thing you have is trust. So they say, if it's on Moira's show, I can understand it. It's like that to me is the trust that I'm building. Um, what you don't understand if you're hearing the biotech, like Biotech Nation, we're back to doing individual podcasts. So they come out one or two times a week, biotechnation.com or go to technation.com. You can click through. We stopped it for a while because people weren't interested. Then the pandemic came along and suddenly everybody knew MNRA, yeah. all this stuff. like, wait a minute. It's like, okay, we're back doing that. Never really stopped, but didn't focus it anymore. Um, and what you don't know is for every like eight minute or 15 minute or 20 minute interview, which just like are just flat, is that every one of those guess and thank god they do it they're ceos chief medical officers chief scientists they spend at least an hour on zoom with me and they say it in their terms like oh i love this it's like well we have a novel mechanism of action uh, for our viral vector and i'm like wait 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 you mean nobody's done it before this is how it works. And you attach your drug to a virus and that's how people get it. Yes. Can you say that? <laughs> like, we spent a long time getting it into terms 
they would say, oh, nobody's going to buy that. Nobody's going to understand that. So I'm not taking what they're saying and then explaining it, which many science reporters, God love them. That's what they have to do. Or journalists, they do. I'm, I'm working with every one of them to say it in a way that, that everyday people can understand, even if they don't have any science. And God love them. The scientists never complain. They go, yeah, that's right. Believe me, if anybody gets anything wrong, we'll hear it. So it's like, as long as it's right, that's it. So that's my, I'm in between the two and we're working, we're working to make it happen. Well, thank you for doing that work because um, it really is important and that's becoming more and more obvious. And so with that, I'm going to um, suggest that we turn to the audience questions. Well, yes, thank you so very much, um, Dr. Gunn and Jameson for this wonderful and engaging conversation. We are now open for questions from the audience. So please again, type your questions into the Q&A section and we will try, we will read them loud. Um, and please also be aware that we might not be able to get all the questions through, but we will try to get as many as possible. Um, I would like to start with um, the following question that, that was asked. Um, what advice do you have for young people interested in science communication or going into the field that you are so famous in? Is there something in our day where, you know, is there a career path towards this or are there some secrets? You already just mentioned something about engaging trust. Um, any advice for the young people in our audience? We have a couple uh, many students and even high school students, I think. So, well, if you can stomach it, <laughs> study science, <laughs> study science, study science, study science, because you can always learn to communicate. Um, in my case, I was never required to take life science. I took physics and chemistry and calculus and this one all the way up to my PhD in mechanical engineering. We were like, I was at the FDA when they said, what do you call a scientist that's not any good at math? And they'd say, they said, a biologist. You know, it's like, I love math. But we're all coming together now. So you study science or if you want to study engineering or if you want to study, but even if you don't, understand who your audience is. I was talking about everyday people. I was talking about anybody's listening to this. Can they understand this without understanding science? It's like, who do you want to communicate to? Who is your audience? If your audience are scientists, let's say you want to write for science or nature, then they're going to, probably going to be read by scientists. So you better get some science degrees. If you are you know, if you are thinking every day, if you're thinking pop culture, if you're thinking explanatory, think of the audience you want to deliver it to, because I think you probably have that in mind already. And then who they are, you match them. And what I was describing said, I guess, how could I end up with all of this bio and biotech when I had no biology background? I never even took biology in high school. Don't tell anybody. I might lose everything, <laughs> but I think it helps because I'm not coming in with that bias, but I was already down the field in media and communications. So your first step is going to be here. Whatever you think you're going to do now, you're not going to be doing 10 years after that or 10 years after that or 10 years after that. So that's your first step. And then we'll see where you go from there. So I have another question for you. Um, there are two critical times in women's professional careers, junior professionals and those who near the ceiling where competition increases. So can you provide insights to our broad-based professional part participants for their careers? And in terms of women's health, do you have thoughts on how we as engineers, academics, that we can engage more proactively and effectively for women's health? I like the last part of that question, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, something that Mohammed Yunus told me when I first interviewed him um, uh, was really important. He said, when we first started this, 
I uh, he actually walked through a little village and all these people had sewing machines, but they were clearly poverty stricken. And they said, oh, yes, well, we have to rent the sewing machines and rent buy the material. And then they gave us a little bit of, you know, they were making nothing. And he sent his graduate student back and he said, uh, well, what? how much would it cost to just buy all the sewing machines and the material in the village? And then they would start to make money. And he, they, he came back and said, $27. <laughs> it was like, what? You know, but they were keeping these people in poverty because that was the only way they could make anything. Fast forward, he comes up with Grameen Bank. The first people he was lending to were almost exclusively male as the head of the park. They wouldn't, they weren't generating things. They spent the money. And then they went and they started lending to women almost exclusively. And the, and the women who are recipients actually are part owners of the bank. So they have millions of owners of the bank and they work together in five so that if someone has to get something out, then the, and somebody else is watching their children and only two of the five can have a loan. And they have, I think it's called the 16 rules, the 18 rules, whatever. It's like, you have to take care of your children. You have to have you go to school. You have to do this. You help each other do it. And the truth is, is that when you, when you focus on women's health, you end up focusing on everyone's health. Hmm. And I think that that is the, that's the misnomer. That's this focus is taking care of the entire family, children, male and female and husband. All of this is there. And they ended up paying back the money. They're stronger and stronger than other ever. Uh, in terms of ceilings, I would like to point out, you can go out and look. Dr. Eunice has been under a lot of attacks, unfairly, from my perspective, from what I can see, because uh, there's a lot of money floating around and they don't like it. When you're succeeding, you will be attacked. Overtly, covertly, you're coming up to a ceiling um, of any kind. I gave my advice earlier. Take a good look at that ceiling. Let everybody know what you want and everything. And then just back up and figure out what's my way around this? Because they're prepared to stop you. So why would you? It's like, oh, yes. Hi. It's so great to see you. But then you figure out a way around. Almost always there's a way around. And uh, and it may not be here today, but you may need time to go by. Um, it's not fair. Life's not fair. Um, and you'll really know it's not fair. I think for me, the real unfair was I took over a program years ago, made it a huge success, went on to do something else. It was failing. I said, for free, I'll come back and fix this program and continue to do what I do. And the person I was working for said, no, they would rather the whole thing fell apart. It's bringing in like $5 million a year. It's like, are you crazy? Whatever it was, I wasn't going to be able to do it. And it was like, you don't know who you're going to run into. Not everybody's going to like you. It has nothing to do with your self-worth. So whenever you run into that, go around. But also, and I mean this because Purdue and its degrees made such a difference to me, always get degrees, especially if you don't know what you want to do. It's like, <laughs> when you're sitting around, you know, you wait five years and all of a sudden you go, oh, I think I want to be a doctor. It's like <laughs> five years went by. Just get a good degree of something and another degree. Collect the degrees. And uh, because as a female, you have to have a whole lot more qualifications than anybody else. And even then, they'll may find a reason to say no. But just, just keep doing it. I have another question here from um, one of our attendees. Indiana ranks 48th in the support for healthcare. How do we begin to get our leaders to begin to rethink priorities and make a healthy populace as important as attracting new businesses to the state? And can Purdue play a role in this? And I guess this is a question also for how do we communicate this to our leaders? Let's call up Mike Pence. No, <laughs> <laughs> no we'll leave him alone for the time being. Every four years, we elect a new president. Every four years, millions of young people can now vote. Every four years, it used to be the old people die off. But take, <laughs> take a look at Leah and me. We ain't going anywhere. <laughs> we intend to die of old age, and biotech is going to help you. 
decades we have in front of it. Dr. Fauci just retired at 81. He had no intention of retiring if they had treated him better, but he's just going to go on and do other things. Rita Colwell, what is she, 84? I mean, she's not stopping, you know? And so the, the thing is, is that what is coming in is new. Those, you got to commit, you have to understand that. And what is going old, the old thinking has to go. There is also a tendency because of this to latch onto power. If you got the power, you want to keep it. Independent of the good of the people, the good of anyone. So that has to change, but it will change with new people. We'll see how it changes. In France, it was a law. 20 years ago, something like they made a law 25 years ago, that half of the pop, half of those elected officials must be female. <laughs> that would certainly change priorities. So when we're talking about reflecting the populace, may not be the populace you like, but if we are actually reflecting the populace, then I think that 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 is a law that could change a lot of things. You know, so I think we have to think about within the democratic system, things that reflect today. I mean, we have to remember that our founding fathers, God love them. Women couldn't vote. Men who did not own property couldn't vote. You know, we could, women couldn't even own property. You know, we were property, you know, <laughs> so things have to change. But I think we have a representative government and we could see, we saw that what happened the last midterm. We have to fight to make sure that these people are in there. But to an earlier question uh, or an earlier conversation we were having about misinformation and that type of thing, one of the things that uh, we're in sort of 1.0 on social media. And people, you could say anything you wanted on social media. You could say anything you wanted to the mainstream. You could say, there's no consequences. There are always consequences. Why do you think the Victorians had all these rules about how you speak to someone? People don't do well if they're treated badly. People don't do well if bad things are said about them. People don't do well if misinformation is spread. And we've seen that grow and subside over history. When we can finally do broadsheets in London, they push them out constantly all day. You could say horrible things. We have to get to a point where we're respectful and we are held accountable for what we say and what we put out. That is, that's, that's that arc of truth. We have to come down. These are all new. We're learning about it. Okay. Now it's time. Now it's time to bring that in and still have all the freedom we can imagine. Wonderful. I think it is um, 7.30, so I do want to thank you all again, and we will need to end at this point. Sorry if your question has not been asked yet. I'm sure um, we can collect them and maybe send them to Dr. Gunn for, for some um, additional uh, input. For those answers. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much again, Dr. Jameson, and special thanks to you, Dr. Gunn, for the inspiring discussion. Thank you. Um, please uh, give me thank um, you. to a virtual thank you and applause. And please I'll visit the Women's Global Health Institute website for the video link to the recording of this interview if you want to hear it again or want to pass it on to somebody who couldn't make it tonight. And also to learn more about our upcoming events, such as the Retreat on Women's Health, which is co-hosted with the Indiana CTSI on February 17th in 2023. And if you enjoy events like this one tonight, um, also, please click the gift link in our in your chat box or come to our website. And thank you again for your interest. And we hope to see you again all for our next events.